2018 come and gone. This past year I think I spent a lot more time on far fewer games. I don't know if I planned it that way or it just sort of happened. One contributing factor though is that I did something I never do. In all my years of gaming I, I very rarely try to homebrew anything. Yet this year I spent a lot of time on several homemade projects, variations, of games that I was playing. Let's tear into and see what we did. So after finishing 2017 playing the Russian campaign, I was still in a nostalgic frame of mind. So I decided to dig out one of my very old games, Africa Core. I think this was second edition. The blue and the pink counters. Simple rules. Not much on the simulation side of things, but a decent game. You know, it had some weird tricks and quirks you could use to run certain um, gambits to try to win the game. But if you ever looked at this as history, you probably didn't know the history of this campaign very well. It rarely played out that way. Now, the only real significance to having dug out and played this game is that I realized three plus years ago I made a very bad error. Nothing good ever comes from cleaning out basements or garages. So the box that I thought contained a bunch of junk actually contained some of the first war games I ever played, I ever bought, including my very first, which was the original squad leader. So uh, that thing is melting at the bottom of a landfill somewhere right now. Regrettable, but, you know, I hadn't seen it in decades, and I was probably never going to play it again, but just the idea my very first war game is now gone forever. Drag. After that brief trip down memory lane, I pulled out this 2017 release from Marshall Enterprises. Got to it a little late, but tore into this one in January, and really for probably about two and a half months. It's La Bataille de Port La Prusse. It's the, uh, basically the war between the French and the Prussians in 1806, which admittedly was a crushing Prussian defeat, smashing French victory. But this is a pretty decent package. It has three complete games in it and a boatload of scenarios. Starts out with uh, Sawfeld, which was a preliminary battle. It's a, it's a small, good introductory game. Decent map space, small number of forces, and, you know, it was a big French victory, as all these battles were, but the victory conditions kind of give you something to fight for. Now, as the Prussian player in this, in this title, it's a little rough. Prussian has a poor army. They take a beating. But um, you can try to lose less badly than they did historically and gain victories that way. So Sawfeld, there is, gosh, I can't remember how many maps, eight maps in all, maybe ten. Uh, Jena, and then Hassenhausen, which is a remake of the Auerstedt battle. Now, Jena is a tough battle as well because the Prussians just take a beating. But there is an alternate history scenario called Super Jena, and that involves, you know, like the, the Jena map, but then with all the forces of the armies concentrated for a hypothetical battle on the Jena battlefield. So that's kind of fun, you know. It gives the Prussians a little more forces to deal with, a little more of a fighting chance. But the gem, I think, is the Hassenhausen game. Uh, it has more map space than the original Auerstedt. You know, a slightly updated order of battles. But it's the most balanced. It's the one where the Prussians really have a chance not just to win the game, but actually kind of win the battle. It may not make any difference historically, but... You know, it can feel a little better as a player to actually defeat the enemy rather than just lose less badly. So, so that big dog took me all the way into March. Let's kind of see what comes next. In March, I took on this nice little title from White Dog Games called War in the Pacific. I've been looking for a decent Pacific War title on the strategic level for some time. Quite often they're very 
very large, very complicated, just more than I was looking for. And this one kind of seemed like it could fit the bill. I kind of hemmed and hawed on it, but I finally went ahead and did it. And I was really glad I picked this one up. It's very simple in terms of mechanics and rules, but very complex in terms of interactions and effects. It's not, it's not very large. Um, the map, I think, is 22 by 17. Large hexes, covers the the Pacific in the, you know, the Pacific Rim. The forces are all abstracted. They're just, you know, units of infantry, surface ship, aircraft carriers, things like that. And it's more of a chess-like kind of game. You have alternating activations between players, limited resources with which to undertake those activations. And it kind of plays out in a very tense way. Despite being abstract, it has a very historical feel. The beginning has the Japanese, you know, running roughshod, establishing their defensive perimeter. And then in the end, they can use that inter interior line of defense to sort of fend off the growing Allied power, and they can survive, they can win the game. And even though the Allies end up having far more power, it's really hard to break through these defensive lines and make a run on those Jap Japanese home islands. So it almost always comes down to the last couple of turns. The thing that keeps it fresh are these event cards. And there are cards for every um, every year. And you draw cards and then play them against each other. There are things, you know, political, well, not really political, but political events that have effects on the resources, movement, combat, and so on that you can undertake in the game. And they can have a good... Um, Good effect on play, but also keeps things really fresh on repeated plays. So I, so I really enjoyed this one. Got a lot of good play out of it. And it's fairly inexpensive, so it's good value for the money. But after War in the Pacific... Move back to the Gunpower Age in April with this title from Compass Games. Battle Him is the system name. And this first one incorporates two battles, Gettysburg and Pea Ridge, in one package. This is a brigade level American Civil War title. Um, I have been searching for what amounts to the successor, for me anyway, to the Gamer Civil War Brigade series which was my go-to for so long. Just looking for something, you know, updated, fresher, and, you know, in print. And this is a really interesting game. It's a really very beautiful game. The map for both battles. A kind of, of an evocative period feel. It's at, uh, you know, about 250 yards, 300 yards a hex. I can't remember exactly. But um, it focuses on combat. It's not a command game. It's not a logistics game. Very heavily focused on how the um, interactions of combat and movement occur on the battlefield. So the counters are kind of focused on that. They're good looking. They're large. Another game with large counters that I'm growing fond of. And all, all in all, it plays really nicely, pretty quickly. It has um, a sequence of play that is driven by chit draw to determine movement and combat, both. None of the sequences are fixed. Combat occurs when you draw a chit. Movement occurs when you draw a chit. So it keeps it very, very dynamic, very flexible, hard to predict, which is, is kind of fun at this scale. Now, it is really heavy on dice and markers for combat resolution. You throw a lot of dice, you record hits, then you roll dice again to figure out what the result is in terms of casualties or demoralizations. So it's a whole lot of dice, marker, marker out, marker in. I can't remember who, but someone designed some counters to kind of help with that. So instead of swapping counters in, you rotate them. So I had those printed up, and they worked really well. 
one thing with Gettysburg is you will run out of the marker counters really quickly when you get to the whole battle. You have a massive uh, fight going on on all, all fronts. So having some extras was really helpful. Now for pure simulation value, I'd still give the nod to Civil War Brigade, but this is just a much faster playing um, entry in this this genre, and pretty worthy. Uh, I, I did enjoy it. Getting this one out of the way. Sliding into May, I picked up another title from Command Post Games in the pub battle series. This would be Monmouth Courthouse from the American uh, War of Independence. See, it's a tiny little package. And the purpose of this one was to be a starter game for this system. So it's a tiny map. Uh, this is the 2.0 version of the rules. Basically an 8.5 by 11, or I don't know, 17, something like that, map. And a small number of blocks, you know, so this is this typical command post game stuff. But in a much smaller scale, so you have much fewer blocks, faster playing, a good introduction for people, and very low cost, relatively speaking, for their system. Uh, it just as a game, standalone, it's, it's representative of the system, but honestly, I would have liked, I mean, heck, I would spend to have a slightly larger map, more area, and uh, extend the game time. It kind of ends right where the rest of the British and the American reinforcements would arrive to kind of contest the second half of the battle. That would be, you know, worth gaming. But just as it stands here alone, it's a nice little entry in this system. So with that little one, didn't take a whole lot of time, but it was a good way to get myself back to pub battles a little bit. I then kind of was thinking, I kept thinking back on the battle hymn. And the print and play game I played last year called The Last Full Measure. Both those systems are almost identical in terms of, well, scale, and there are a whole lot of very, very similar mechanics. The biggest difference being combat resolution and then the sequence of play. But I, I like this system a lot, and I decided to sort of take the plunge. What I did was I had the counters, well, I made a lot of effort in enlarging the counters and printing out the maps for the second Manassas game in this system. So this becomes my first home brew. I had to, you know, enlarge the artwork a little bit and the map, and I sent it off to, you know, be professionally, in, in air quotes, printed by Print and Play Games. Now, it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Print and Play is good for, really, prototypes, but it really kind of made the components more accessible to me. I just, I like the bigger size of the uh, counters rather than a standard half fish. Even though the map got a little large, it still was more than small enough to fit on a, the table space I have available. I'll get a bit of the map here. So the larger counters on the slightly larger map in this case, instead of wasting a lot of time cutting and pasting and mounting my own counters, I just wasted that time on graphics man manipulation and then sent that off to the printer. And overall, I think it turned out okay. I was pretty satisfied with it. I like the way the game plays anyway. Um, my next uh, inspiration brought me to Gettysburg in this same system where I did the same thing. Manipulated all the graphics to come up with larger counters, bigger map, lots of time spent, and frankly it was pretty expensive, all things considered, you know, it's basically printing a one-off game as opposed to uh, something at, at uh, you know, mass production to lower cost. But it was worth it for homebrew. It was, it was fun. I, I enjoy the system. After spending a good couple of months in the gunpowder area, American Civil War, I went into 
a total bit of fluff in, in July. That is this game, America Falling, the coming Civil War, from One Small Step Games. This was a lark, kind of a guilty pleasure game. I backed it on Kickstarter thinking it might just be kind of fun to play something like this, see a simulation of it. It kind of got delayed a bit. I sort of forgot about it. And then it was produced and it showed up. And I thought, oh yeah, I remember that. So as the title suggests, it's supposed to be about a, a modern day civil war in these United States. It kind of accents the, the, the typical political divide, red versus blue. Now the maps, and really everything about this game on first look, is kind of attractive. So it basically represents uh, virtually the entire of the United States, except for the um, western areas are kind of abstracted. The rest of it is, um, you know, east coast all the way through kind of Texas, Midwest, as represented as this hex scale. All the cities that are basically under contest are represented. Two, two full maps, very, very large size. There is a huge number of control markers, red and blue, for the political divide, and the red or the blue is displayed based on which side controls. So each player would take you know, a red side or a blue side. There are a fairly small number of counters, red and blue. Um, they're basically back printed, right? Because the idea is that we have one military here and it's either controlled by the red side or it could be flipped and controlled by the blue side. And then some standard markers for game pieces. The rule book is very colorful. It's not a complex game, but you know, there's plenty of little bits and pieces to it to go through. Boy, but I gotta tell you, this was a tough one. The game is kind of saddled with a lot of errata right off the bat. A number of problems with the map, simple misspellings, and, and just little things to detract from it. Um, problems with the counters. They have you know, this huge number of markers that you have to set up on each city to determine which, is, which side controls it. And there are just mistakes on these counters that make, you, you know, make it hard to set up and keep track of where things go. Small, but still, it's just irritating. There are errata and mistakes on the unit counters that, again, distract and make it hard for you to follow where things are supposed to go and when reinforcements arrive. And, you know, these are really bland, boring-looking counters. Just monochromatic, blue and red. It doesn't really draw your eye. And the strange thing is, it's not as if they're lacking any kind of graphical ability. Here is... A very attractive set of counters. A whole sheet dedicated to these very interesting looking counters. Now what, what are they? They are factions. And you know, we have the red and the blue, the two political divides. And then you have a number of factions that can show up during the game to you know that aren't on either side, that have, that are enemies to both. Now each faction is represented by eight counters. And of course there's all these different factions. Here's the thing, there's six turns in the game. At the very absolute maximum, these, these, these factions can uh, appear randomly once per turn. So you can only have six of these counters in play at the most. And that's even kind of far-fetched. Might have one or two. So I've got an entire sheet of very colorful counters that I'm never going to use. I've got this boring counter set that I'm going to use the whole time. It's like I, I could not fathom why the heck that was done that way. Why not invest this kind of creativity into those counters for me? But okay, I, I can get past the counters, the errata, the map mistakes, some of the confusing rules. Geez, what I couldn't get past was the gameplay. It just was dull. You have all the cities on the map you're going to control, and you're basically going to fight for them. And, you know, that's the whole point. And the game is played in a series of activations passed back and forth. The number of activations is based on the number of, well, it's called morale points for some reason. I never could quite figure out what the morale aspect of the game was. But by controlling a city, you gain a point, and you get an activation for each point. 
so there's got to be 150, 170, I can't remember now, points available. So that means you're going to be passing back and forth activations for an interminable amount of time every turn. And there's only six turns. So it just drags on forever. And some of the activations are just move and combat. You've got this huge map, so if you start someone at the lower southwest and you want to move them up to the northeast, well, you know, you're looking at 50 activations to get there. It just played really slow. And some of the things that should have been inter interesting and exciting, such as, you know, turning a an opponent's unit from their side to your side ended up just being really, really repetitive. You'd flip a unit, the opponent would flip it back. Flip it, flip it back. And it's just like nothing seemed to happen. You were just kind of dragging your way through the turns. And yeah, of course, I don't need a disclaimer to explain that all of this is just opinion. Now, I'm, that might be something that's, you know, extremely... That kind of gameplay might be extremely appealing to some, but it just... It just kind of let me down. I, I had more expectations for you know, the guilty pleasure of this, and it just didn't come about. It ended up being really tedious and slow. So after beating my head on this one for a while, I just I had, to, I had to retire it. So let's get this one out of the way. Why couldn't I have thrown this one away by mistake when cleaning house? So now I'm into August. I'm going to begin my great patriotic war phase of my year here. Get that one out of here. I'm going to start it with another game from White Dog Games. I was so happy with War in the Pacific that when I saw this one, I jumped right on it. I didn't even hesitate. Storm in the East is the beginning of the German-Soviet War, 1941, and it uses virtually the exact same system as War in the Pacific. Now it has some unique twists to bring it in line with a giant land war, but otherwise it uses the same kind of limited resources, very similar map size, activations passed back and forth and so on. You know, a nice looking map that is you know, very playable. Um, doesn't really focus too much on that, but it has the same Similar characteristics of abstracted units. You're not looking at a full OOB here. It's just units of infantry, armor, um, air artillery, air power. The same on the Soviet side. It also has a set of event cards that you use to play throughout the game. And the game plays almost identically to War in the Pacific, except it has a couple of really critical things. One of those being um, exploitation for the Germans and um, supply, chains of supply being maintained across the map. Uh, that affects the Germans greatly, but also the Soviets. And much like War in the Pacific, though it's very abstract, you still get very historical kind of results, especially as you're playing. Now, you, you may not like it if like huge areas of the map end up being denuded of Russian forces, like just nothing there. But still, the German player won't just run roughshod because they have to make decisions about their own supply line, their own victory conditions, which direction they'll take, and they just won't have the wherewithal to go everywhere at once. So it's okay to take away forces from the South if you're the Soviet, even though it looks funny on the map if you're a purist from a historical simulation standpoint. It plays out really nicely. And there are some good spots where the Soviets can really assert themselves, make it very hard for the Germans to win. Now, if I'm going to do any griping about Arata, I suppose I have to be fair about it. There's a very tiny piece of Arata right here on this map. For some reason, the little banner cow pens is printed here on the map in the middle of Russia. I don't think that's... Uh, Anywhere near Russia, that's definitely in the United States, been there. But tiny, you barely notice it. And I barely notice this, all these event cards. I played this game for a couple of months before I stumbled across a forum post that clued me in that there were mistakes. And I didn't even notice. One of the mistakes is that sometimes, some of the decks, 
the wrong photo is printed for the event being depicted. Like, mine dogs, this guy, you know, what those, I didn't even notice, I didn't care. But those are, those are incorrect. Others don't even have a photo. Didn't even notice. But now all the printed information that is relevant to the game is all correct. It's just some of the chrome, some of the, some of the pretty is busted. I think there was a point where they would have reprinted the deck for you, but I didn't even care, didn't even want to be bothered. So that's the kind of a rod I can live with right there. So that was an, an abstract simulation of the first year of the German-Soviet War. The next one I took on was a little more traditional and literal. It's a magazine game from Multiman Publishing called Fury in the East. I'd had this one for a good long while. I just never got around to playing it, you know. But since I was on this Eastern Front kick, I figured I'd get started on it. And I, I like this one. The map is nice looking. It depicts virtually the exact same area, a little further south into the Crimea, as a Storm in the East map. Slightly different scale, but still. Um, kind of typical half-inch counters, but you're looking at a more closely represented order of battle. You know, you have the actual corps and armies for the Soviets that were represented in the battle. The fighting and the moving is a little more literal. There's still concepts of supply that's focused on headquarters, keeping units in, um, you know, the ability to attack. There's some interesting rules around Soviet leadership and how that presence is able to control their forces. Uh, the Soviets take massive casualties, but there's an interesting sort of recycling and reclaiming um, concept that will bring them back and keep the keep the fronts occupied, if not you know fighting very effectively. But a really fun aspect of the game is the victory conditions. Essentially, the Germans have victory conditions for places they need to uh, capture, you know, ground they need to take. But those those can switch. There's a table that the German player has to roll on, and that table says they have to go south. You can make all the decisions you need to achieve those conditions south, only to roll on the succeeding turn that now you need to go north. So now you'd have a huge amount of forces committed south, and you can't win the game that way anymore. You Now you have to switch north. So it was a nice little way to make it hard on the Germans and represent some of the history behind the, you know, the, the decisions by the German high command. But I had to take a little break from the Eastern Front of World War II when my first truly homebrew project finally came to uh, a conclusion, or at least was stopped and made ready to play about this time. Back in May, when I was playing Second Manassas from Last Full Measure, I was inspired to try to take on building a First Manassas, that same system using my own wherewithal, such as it is. The easy part, getting an order of battle, working up some counters. This was purely a part-time endeavor every few days, maybe a couple of hours on a weekend, so it took me forever. But I ginned up some counters, had them printed by Print and Play Games, because that's my go-to. I'm not going to be cutting up and pasting anymore. But the real hard part was trying to come up with a map. It's not like sources are lacking, but I just don't have any cartography skills. So after much wrangling, fits and starts, and throwing things out and starting over again, I finally managed a pretty massive map, trying to mimic the graphical style of Last Full Measure. Eh, I call this good enough. It covers the whole battle. I always like First Manassas because it's you know, a gigantic battlefield, but a small amount of forces to contest it. And then you get into, you know, sort of the cat and mouse aspect of where to attack and where to defend. So after all that, after what amounts to several months of time passing, though it was really only about, maybe, I don't know, 50 hours of effort, I finally had this thing. I put it down and played it. And, you know, you always love your children, right? I, th I like the way it plays. I've played other First Manassas games, you know, on similar kind of scales. And I just, 
I think this system lends itself well to that battle. So I really I had a good time with this one, and I, I enjoyed it. But, God almighty, I think I'm done making print-and-play games with these counters and, and these maps. It's just it's too expensive. It's too much effort. And while I appreciate not having to do all the cutting and pasting myself, you know, the, the counters just aren't all that great. There's, there's certain little nubs and things that come out on them just routinely. And in the end, it's just it's too expensive to keep doing that. So at this point, I have, I don't know, three, four games created this way. I think I'm going to be done. That's probably all I'm ever going to do. So I'm going to close out August and lurch into September with yet another game on the German-Soviet War in 1941. And I'll explain my particular reasoning for this a little later, but this is from the gamers in their operational combat series system. Um, if you like OCS, you might find this to be a game you like. It is replete with all of the trappings of a good OCS game, but not the gigantic footprint that is so often, you know, hand-in-hand -hand with those games. So it's very focused on one operation, the, the fight to capture Smolensk in late summer, fall of 1941. So a fairly small map, kind of just have this one major road, and then, if you know the history, there's, you know, pincher attacks and, and, um, uh, German drives, Soviets are doing their best with, you know, pretty weak forces to to stem the tide. This is a game kind of like Jena, where you're the Soviet player, you're going to lose. You're losing the battle. You're going to take horrific casualties, you're going to lose. That's the history. So what you're trying to do as the Soviets is to lose less badly. And the Germans, of course, are trying to win better than they did, or at least as well, historically. Now, OCS is very stable. It's been around for a very long time. So the wrinkles for this game are specific to the game itself, not to the system. The one interesting thing is that the rivalry between the German commanders, north and south, is represented. And you, the player, must respect that. So forces can't intermingle, and you commit supply to one or the other axis of attack. Now, you can start to do whatever you want with that once it's there, but you have to make that decision when the supply arrives. That makes it kind of interesting. The other aspect that's pretty interesting is that, you know, during this campaign, the German high command, there they are again, made a huge decision that basically stripped away almost all of the mobile forces from this sector. So there is a hard date where the Germans will lose the vast majority of their armored and mechanized forces. So you have to move fast and take advantage of those things while you can. And the Soviets can kind of try to play rope-a-dope because they know sooner or later the most powerful German units will be gone and it'll give the Soviets some capabilities for counterattack. So I like this entry. Quite often the OCS can be really kind of intimidating because they're so freaking big and there's so many counters. Sometimes you just don't want to bite it off. But this one is kind of in the middle Small map, still a lot of counters, but, you know, much smaller than some of the huge games. And you get most of the feel, most of the same deep drives and sort of critical supply issues that you see represented in some of the bigger, longer playing games, you know, longer time frame simulating games. Uh, maybe the one knock is that it, it's really pretty expensive for a footprint this size. It's on the high side, but, um, you know, if you're a completist or just want something in this series that uh, won't occupy an entire banquet hall, this could be something for you. So what is with all this Eastern Front stuff? I mean, this isn't a genre or an era that I'm particularly drawn to. I don't, I don't have a lot of stuff on this. I don't really play very much on it. So why am I going to all this bother? 
Well, I, I pledged a game, can't remember when it was, last year, from Victory Point Games called Thunder in the East. And I had thought it would come out in the fall of 2018. Didn't quite get there. It came out in the end of December. That's when I received it. So I didn't get to, to play it. Still in the still in the wrapper. But that's why. I thought I'll play some Eastern Front games, get myself in the mood, and then take on this one. Honestly, it was you know, so long ago that I pledged this thing, I kind of didn't even know what I was getting into. This is, that is hefty, man. This thing is heavy. I know it's stock f chock full of stuff. I have been paying attention to um, other people's experience with it at this point. I think it's probably a lot bigger than I expected when I pledged it. I know they have a plan to do like the entire African, European, even uh, in the Scandinavia theater, in one gigantic inter you know, interplayed game. Uh, I didn't know I was getting into something that big. But this one I think is going to be interesting. Apparently I was so enamored by it. I pledged it twice. I don't really remember doing that, but uh, clearly I did because I paid for it twice. I see where I got the receipts twice. So, uh, I don't need anything, two of anything in, in the world. But uh, I'm going to have two of these. So I'll be looking at this one in 2019. But running back away again from the mechanized mayhem of World War II to the Napoleonic Age with yet another pub battles install, uh, installment. This is on Waterloo. I'm a big fan of these games. I love the components. I like the, the gameplay. I like the focus on, you know, movement and uh, a, a style of command that's based on players and not on the, the pieces. You know, you have the, the game in hand, not the pieces. It has the typical Pub Battles map. For Pub Battles, this is a pretty big game. You know, here's the sort of the characteristic Waterloo area, but it has lots of map, both north and east and west. I know there's some potential for games that would link together with the other battles of the, the Hundred Days era here that would potentially make for a very large uh, entry, maybe giving you the opportunity to game the entire um, campaign. And some of that's represented by the number of blocks that are present. There's a huge number of blocks just for the armies fighting here. You know, the, the typical pub battles blocks representing the French Army of the North, the British and their allies, and the Prussians. I can't remember where the Prussians are. I think these are them. And then a huge number of blocks are still here. They're not exactly extras. They just don't necessarily play into this battle. Now, there are um, alternates where you can bring the French right wing that was supposed to be pursuing the, the Prussians onto the battle here and participate. But otherwise, you can straight up fight Waterloo with a historical uh, forces and presentation on the field. They did produce a version 2.5 of the standard rules. They've kind of taken the thing into, you know, a product offering of the standard rules, and then each of the games ends up being what they call a scenario of those rules. But um, one of the th not a lot changed in terms of the standard rules, but one of the things I like is this optional baggage train concept. You can, if you want to, I didn't, but <laughs> you could, take the stickers, use the blocks to make baggage trains, and then those um, kind of factor into the game both positively and negatively. They become a risk for you to, if you should lose them to the enemy you know, as victory conditions, but also you use them to rally forces. You can't rally unless you're in range of a baggage train. I'm a big fan of these games. They're very much games. There is plenty of historical simulation value, but you know that's not its purpose. It is abstracted, and there are occasionally 
things that are a little funny about the way the game plays. For instance, the French obviously have full knowledge of the field and know exactly where the Prussians are going to come from. So on the first turn, they're going to move immediately to the west to try to stem the tide. The longer they can delay them, the more they can then just pound at the British. Um, there's a bit of an imbalance. I hate to use that word. But just the French forces are capable of a attack on the move, which you know is basically called a charge in this system, whereas most other forces are not. So they just charge at the British with their plentiful charge-capable forces, pound them into dust, while you know much earlier delaying the Prussian advance. And it's it's hard to beat that French strategy. You can by just retreating. So if the British just more or less get out of here and go back and just keep stalling for time, you can kind of you know run the clock out and get a draw out of it. Those aren't criticisms. That's just a game. This is game. If you want history, you probably want a different... Um, if you want a historical simulation, you probably want a different kind of treatment. But as a fun and playable game that gives a lot of back and forth and choices to the players, I really, really dig these. So October was a good month. Love that pub battles. And it's also the time of year that Marshall Enterprises produces their next entry in the Le Bataille series. And this year, that entry was Deutsch Wagram, the 1809 you know, Titanic battle between the Austrians and the French. Now, before I get into that one, got to make a correction. I forgot the 2017 entry, Pour Le Proust, actually has four games, not three. I always forget about the final game. That's Le Bataille de Halle which is a remake of the print-and-play game with the same title that Marshall put out 2011, maybe? That kind of marked their return to publication. So four games in that Pour Le Proust package. One gigantic game in the Wagram package. So... A huge number of counters for this, you know, 300,000 man confrontation. There are six standard Le Bataille scale maps depicting essentially the area around Wagram and the Wussbach where most of the fighting took place. And then charts, a whole bunch of scenarios. Now there's an aspect to the battle that is sort of abstracted in this game, and that is the Austrian drive against the Danube to go against the uh, French left to try to capture the bridges. They present that with this sort of point-to-point -point game. So if you play the, you know, like the big dog main battle, Wagram, July the 6th, you can simulate the effects of that attack with this. But they also have a scenario where anyone with the Asper and Essling title from three years ago, maybe, can get those four maps and mate them with the six maps from Wagram and then have the entire battle, north to south, east to west, Danube up to, you know, the through the Marshfeld. It's huge. I can't show that. Uh, it takes up too much space. It's like four full banquet, ta banquet tables. But uh, it's impressive. Uh, if you like Le Bataille, it's something... You know, it's, it's worth seeing. I'm glad I did it, but probably will never do that again. But, huge game. Long playing game. Took me time in October to prep it. Then started playing it in November through December. You know, Le Bataille is very detailed. This is so big. It just took a while. And while I was playing, and I also had Pub Battles Waterloo set up somewhere else when tinkering with that, I read a blog post. It was entitled... Let me think. Logram for apartment dwellers on a budget. And it detailed this guy's sort of odyssey of putting together kind of a mini miniatures version of Vagram. He hand drew a map. He used 3D printing to create um, miniatures. It was all fairly small, fit on a table, and he played out the game. And I thought, God, well, that's pretty cool. 
I can't do miniatures, but just the idea of the huge Vagram at a different scale with a different system really appealed to me. And of course I looked across at another table and saw Pub Battles Waterloo and I thought, damn, can I do a Pub Battles Vagram? Been better if I had not seen that because that started my own personal odyssey, trying to see if there's any way for me to put this thing together, to get a map, to make up pieces, and figure out how to play the huge Vagram at the pub battles style and scale. Now I thought there were a lot of blocks for pub battles Waterloo. That kind of pales in comparison to pub battles Vagram. So I had to come up with stickers and cut all these flipping blocks, paint them for both Austrian and French armies. That was very time consuming. Now, at least the orders of battle were easy to find, especially at the pub battle scale. So I fiddled with that. Ended up with this giant mass. But that's, that's nothing if you don't have a good map. Now, I tried and tried to draw a period looking kind of map from sources and I just I don't have any skill in that regard. Now I have all the blocks, so clearly you can guess that I came up with something, right? So what I did was I pieced together enough period maps just to print one out. It's not perfect. It's obviously not of the era. It's, you know, probably 50 years later. But it's damn close. And I decided to go with that. And I gotta tell you, I had a real ball with it. The huge scope of the map, far bigger than anything Pub Battles could ever do, plus the gigantic number of pieces made it really interesting to watch the battle ebb and flow. And it can play very, very historically. You know, if you take into account a couple of things, a couple of interesting bits about this battle, and, you know, work those into some kind of uh, game-specific rule, you can really watch, you know, the French left be crushed back by the Austrian, and then watch the French crash against the Rosbach, and trying to take Wagram up there. So, I'd call it pretty successful. I really wish I could come up with a better map, but I had a good fun time, and it was simple. It was something I could achieve. I can't draw counters, I can't draw artwork, but man, I can cut blocks and paint them. So this was right in my wheelhouse. Too expensive by far, too much effort by far. I can't see myself ever doing this again, but uh, it was a, kind of a fun way to end, end the year in gaming in 2018. So for my favorites, I think I'll go with War in the Pacific and Pub Battles Waterloo. This one was a real sleeper hit for me. Enjoyed it a lot. I think it has a lot of replay value. I just think the scope and the components of this Waterloo entry are really, really high quality and make it a lot of fun, a lot of playable fun. Yeah, it's really expensive. I can't fight you on that one but uh, it's a really nice to have entry in this particular system.